Thank you for joining us here this morning at Sierra Vista Community Church's online Sunday service. My name is Jim Carlisle, and with me is Miguel Torres. We're going to start this morning by worshiping in song. Let's gather together, even though we're apart. Let's gather our hearts together and come to the throne. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands. No tongue can bid me then steep heart. No tongue can bid me then steep heart. When Satan tempts me to despair tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there, who made an end of all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great and changeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die. My soul is purchased by His blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. Because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me. Look on him and pardon me. Pastor Ruben has been doing his series on faith. So let's sing this song called Faith. Greater is he that's living in me than he. 
he that is in the world. Faith, I can move the mountain, I can do all things through Christ. I know faith, standing and believing, I can do all things through Christ. He strengthens me, faith, I can move the mountain, I can do all things through Christ. Greater is he that's living in me than he that is in the world. Faith, I can move the mountain, I can do all things through Christ. I know faith, standing and believing, I can do all things through Christ. God, you're my everything. You're everything I have. You're everything I need. Without you, I'm nothing. I pray, Lord, that for all of us, that we can make you that everything, that you will be our all in all. strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my
We'd like to thank you for partnering with us with your tithes and your offerings. If you'd like to continue to give, please go online at give.svccfamily.org or you can send in your check to 514 North Telshore Boulevard, Las Cruces, New Mexico, 88011. Let's pray. Father, we come before your throne this morning. We are seeking your blessing. We are seeking your guidance and we are seeking your healing. Lord, we thank you for your son, the sacrifice that he made so that we can be in your presence. Lord, please take these offerings. Please bless the givers. We want you to use that to reach more people, to grow your kingdom. Father, we ask that you help us deal with fear, with anger, frustration, hatred, this anxiety that we have and these, un these times that we don't know what's going on. Father, we just ask that your Holy Spirit completely surround us each and every day protecting us, guiding us, giving us wisdom so that we know how to live in these uncertain times. Father, we ask that you remove these troubles from our mind, that we can focus solely on you and continue to do your work and your will. We give this to you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our current series, a faith that works when life doesn't. Today we're going to be looking at part three. We are now in our 16th week of not being able to gather due to COVID-19. I had announced that we would begin gathering on July 12th, but due to delays uh, beyond our control, we moved the date back to July 19th. However, listening to our governor just yesterday, um, to her update, she mentioned actually that our state was back in the red and that she was moving uh, the consideration of phase two until July 15th. Uh, but we know in the midst of all this that things are really unpredictable. So would you please continue to pray uh, that by then our gathering capacity would be uh, moved up to at least 50%. And, and church, by the way, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you for your continued diligence. We appreciate all of you honoring our governor's mandates, our city's mandates, uh, the washing of hands, the social distancing, the staying at home, and of course, the wearing of masks. We really appreciate you doing that. You're part of helping us get out of this uh, mess that we're in right now. As we get into God's word this morning, I'd like for us to just bow our heads in prayer. If you feel comfortable doing that, just go ahead and join us as, uh, as we go before the Lord and, and ask him to bless this time together. Uh, Father, we're grateful. We're grateful to you, first of all, Father, and we're grateful, Father, that you've kept us healthy and safe. And Father, we pray that as we continue to do our part in, in maintaining uh, uh, good health, that, that you would bless it. And Father, as we get into your word, especially today's topic, Father, we pray that you would bless it. We pray that you would use it, Father, to bring comfort to us, that you would help us, Father, e trust even more in you. Uh, Father, thank you for technology. Thank you for the ab ability to be able to do this today. And again, Father, we pray that your word would not return void, that it does the work that it's intended to do in our hearts. And we pray this in your name. Amen. My goal for this current series is to share with you uh, realistic and biblical principles that will help you in the days to come. That is to help you navigate this, uh, this crisis smoothly, skillfully, and confidently. I want you to learn how to control the things that are uncontrollable in your life and to trust God in the midst of all the mess that we're going through. During these trying times, I've actually chosen, I prayed about it, and God led me to the little book of, of, of James 
in the Bible because it was written. We talked about this a few weeks ago. It was written actually to encourage those who were experiencing severe pressure and stress due to the crisis that they were facing and experiencing at their time. Also mentioned two weeks ago that the book of James is only five chapters long and it's only 108 verses. But man, is it crammed with revelation that we need and, and we need in our lives right now. So my plan is to teach for the next six weeks out of the book of James. And, and, and you notice that I said six weeks, unless <laughs> the Lord directs differently, we'll modify that accordingly. But I do hope that you'll stick with us through the rest of this series, because I do know that if you apply these principles that we're teaching out of God's word, it will change your life. Now, this past week, I read a number of news articles I watched uh, on the news and so on. And as people talked about the increasing number of outbursts of anger and irritability in our society due to this, this outbreak, this pandemic. But this one article actually caught my attention. It, it happened uh, only about a mile from our home, and um, it was reported in the Las Cruces Sun News. Let me read it to you. It says, an alleged battery over the use of masks in public for COVID-19 protection took place Monday, June 22nd at the Walgreens on North Main Street. Lynn Moore, a local attorney, said she was struck by an unknown fellow customer after she asked uh, the couple uh, where their face coverings were. The man said, show me the law. And Moore said, well, I said, okay, I'll show you, just hang on a minute, and I'll show you the governor's order, which, because I'm an attorney, I carry that around in my purse with me. Recognizing that a number of people you know who are confused about the mask requirement might not realize it. Moore said that as she pulled out the order, the man smacked her across the face and called her a bad name. I'm not going to mention the name. And she said she's got a pretty good bruise on the side of her face and she has headaches, but she declined further medical assistance. Dan Trujillo, spokesman for the Las Cruces Police Department, said the battery complaint Moore filed is under investigation, but no arrests or charges have been made. Trujillo said LCPD started receiving reports of noncompliance of the governor's public health order, which among other things requires the use of face coverings and social distancing of at least six feet since March or April. But she said encouraging people to follow the health orders is the extent to which the LCPD can respond to noncompliance reports. We strongly encourage the wearing of masks and social distancing, Trujillo said. We respect that many businesses enforce their own guidelines on wearing masks within the, their stores or within their property. Moore said that because of her elderly mother, she tries to limit trips out into public. I read that story and my heart sank. Folks, getting angry, slapping a stranger, a complete stranger over the wearing of mask. Well, which takes us actually to our text today that's found in James chapter 1, verses 19 to 20. And this is what it says. Knowing this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and watch this, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So how do you do this? How do you actually remain untroubled in trouble, or in this case, the story that I read, conflict? Well, confession. This is a good place for me to do a little confession. I'm not where I need to be on this, but I'm not where I used to be, and I'm getting better. And the reality is, is I'm still... That's one of the things that I wrestle with in the flesh is my anger. So I got to tell you that these principles that I'm going to share with you, these principles that James talks about here in James chapter 1, verses 19 to 20, actually work. I've applied them in my own personal life, and, and thank God that I'm making some progress with handling my own anger. So the first one is count the cost of unmanaged anger. Of course, the first step in learning how to control it is you've got to count the cost of unmanaged anger because then you're like less likely to get anger if you remember that there's always a significant cost for uncontrolled anger. The Bible says, and it talks a lot about this, by the way, and one of the places that it mentions it is Proverbs 29, verse 22, and this is what it says. A man of, of wrath stirs up strife, and one given to anger, now listen to this, stirs or causes much transgression. Causes much transgression. What's he trying to say is here, the writer of Proverbs? Actually, what he's saying is this, that a hot-tempered man gets into all 
kinds of trouble. And folks, I can raise my hand and say, hey, I'm a witness to that. I've done some stupid stuff. I've stepped right in the middle of it because I let my anger get the best of it. However, as I look out into the audience, I know this, that I'm not alone in it. You've probably done the same thing. In fact, if I could see you this morning, I'd probably see a lot of heads nodding in agreement up and down with me. Now listen to what Proverbs chapter 15, verse 18 says. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife. But he who is slow to anger quiets contention. And by the way, that's one of those verses that I've had to apply in my own life. And, and how about this one? Has anybody ever done this? Proverbs chapter 14, verse 17, out of the Good News Bible. It says, people with hot tempers do foolish things. Have you ever done something stupid in your anger and then stepped back away from it and said, can't, I can't believe that I even did that. How about in your family? Proverbs eleven twenty nine 29, out of the Living Bible, the fool who provokes his family to anger and resentment, now listen to the consequences, will finally have nothing worthwhile left. And the reality is that, uh, that, that oftentimes in anger, we alienate, we push people away. And by the way, anger is not a good motivator for your children. It only produces anger. It, it causes apathy. And it causes alienation. And at the end, you heard the verse, all you have is nothing left. The second way to remain untroubled is choose to manage your anger. It's where you literally say to yourself, and I like this, I'm tired of hurting myself. And Lord, I got to be honest with you. I'm tired of hurting other people with my anger. And I'm choosing from this day forward, with God's help, I'm choosing to manage my anger appropriately. Listen, folks. Quit saying that you can't control it. Quit saying that's just how I am. And, and, and start realizing that you can control it. Stop making excuses and start accepting responsibility for your reactions. Listen, nobody made you angry. You chose to get angry. Have you ever been in a heated discussion and have yours truly, Pastor Reuben, walk up? Perhaps you're out eating in public or whatever, and you've gotten into this heated subject, or maybe even here at church. And, and I walk up to you, and all of a sudden I see the smiles go on, and the attitude changes, and everything's hunky-dory, and you're smiling and everything else. Did you catch what happens? In those moments, you were able to control your anger because you had to or you wanted to. All of a sudden, you chose to manage your anger. Listen to what Proverbs 29 verse 11 says. A fool gives full vent to his spirit. And, and by the way, that spirit is also translated as anger in, in the Good News Bible. But a wise man quietly holds it back. So what does it mean to hold it back? That anger actually means that it's a choice, that it is manageable. And we've all probably said this at one time or another, oh, you make me so angry. The truth is nobody can control your emotions without you letting them. You see, Nothing or no one can make you angry. It's my choice to get angry. And you choose to get angry. And, and by the way, that word choose means to decide on a course of action in advance and typically after rejecting alternatives. So that means that when you put yourself in a situation that's going to get heated and you know there's a tendency or a possibility to get angry, you can choose in advance how you're going to react to that. It's where you go. I've got to be honest. I've got this tendency to get angry pretty quick. I need to plan in advance how to manage my anger next time that I start feeling that anger start rising. The third way to remain untroubled is consider before reacting. In other words, let me just lay it out there plain. Think before you speak. You know, sometimes I, uh, I know that there's a, a situation I need to address or, or, or there's a response I need to make, but I know that if I speak too quickly, I'm gonna get in trouble. So do what James suggests for us to do. Back to James 1.19. My beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. The whole point of the book of James is to teach us. To teach us what? To teach us to live as Christians when we face trouble. James says this. If you claim to be a Christian, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, then you need to act like one. And he says, you need to do that in every situation that you find yourself. 
James reminds us that our behavior is determined by our beliefs and a reflection, listen to this, and a reflection of the way that God treats us. Whatever he's telling us to do in trouble, he says, always make the point that it starts from the inside out. He, he moves, or that is, James moves from being to doing. And that's important for us as Christians, because often we get caught up in the doing. But he says, you move from being to doing. And he says, move from character to conduct. And he says, moves from your identity in Christ to how I act in the world. And he says, it's moved and it's determined from belief to behavior. So in James 1.19 again, and I'm going to repeat this several times in this message, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So let's look at that. Let's, let's dissect that verse. The first part is be quick to hear. Did you know that the quickest way to diffuse somebody's anger is basically to give them your attention? It's just calmly and genuinely listen to them. That's it. You don't use your mouth, you use your ears. Being, lis being uh, listened to actually calms people down. And when you don't feel like you're being listened to, what happens to all of us? We begin to feel like we get a little angry. By the way, really listening to someone helps you understand why they're troubled in the first place. The next part of the verse says, be slow to speak. Why does James say, be slow to speak? Because anger is basically a matter, now you got to get this, it's basically a matter of mouth control. You tame your temper by taming your tongue. Anger management starts with watching your words. If you're going to learn to control your anger, listen, you have to learn how to control your mouth. Delay is a great remedy to this because the longer you hold your temper, or that is control your temper, the more that it improves. So you give yourself time to reflect, you give yourself time to think, and you think it through. Jefferson, the second president of the United States, you probably remember this, uh, he said, when you're angry, count to 10, and if you're really angry, count to 100. Why? Because delay helps you calm down. And then the latter part of that verse says, be slow to anger. If you're quick to hear and slow to speak, and, uh, uh, then slow to anger is actually gonna come naturally. Did you notice James uses the word slow twice? He says this, he says, slow to speak and slow to anger. So what do you do during that delay? Well, one of the things that I try to do, and I, I'm gonna encourage you to do the same thing, is you actually try to figure out why people are angry in the first place. In fact, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11 says this, a man's wisdom gives him patience. So what's the point here? Is the point is, is the more I understand my anger, or perhaps somebody else's anger, the more understanding that I'll be. And, and as I mentioned already, it's true of others as well, is the more understanding I am uh, about my spouse's anger, the more understanding I'll be. Uh, the more understanding of my child's anger, the more understanding of my child I'll be. And the more understanding of others' anger, the more understanding I will have of them. So here's the point again. If you reflect before reacting, then you can begin to identify the root cause of your anger. And typically, I want to help you with this, typically the root cause of anger boils down to just three things. And we've talked about these in the past, but the first is hurt. When you're emotionally or physically wounded, you uh, begin to, to get angry. For instance, you get out of bed in a hurry, maybe there's a noise in the house or whatever, and your wife has moved uh, the bed, and, and you stub your toe. What's the first thing you do? You get angry. And when you get hurt, hurt causes anger. The second is frustration, and man, we've been there. Because frustration can also cause anger in us. That's when you get irritated, when you're forced to wait in line when you got other things to do, when nothing seems to work right, when you can't control a situation. You seem to get angry over those things. And the third cause of anger is fear. That's when you get threatened, when we feel attacked, when we feel afraid, when we get angry. And, and, and by the way, anger is actually a sign of insecurity because anger and insecurity go together. So the more insecure I feel, the more angry I'm going to be. And while you're being quick to listen and you're being slow to speak, 
while you're doing that, I would encourage you, and I want you to write this down because I want you to, to, to write this down, memorize it, and I want you to encourage to silently pray it whenever you're feeling like you're getting angry. And, and it's Psalm 141, verse 3. Listen to this. What a great verse. Lord, help me control my tongue and help me to be careful about what I say. And I got to tell you, folks, a lot of us need to pray like that, don't we? So with that, I want to give you three questions to consider to help you understand your anger. The first one is, why? Why am I angry? Why am I hurt? Why am I frustrated or fearful? And it could go back to those three things that I just mentioned. Or number two, what is it that I really want? And, and by the way, let me help you with this. You know, in America, we live in a country where it's about me instead of, uh, instead of being about we. And sometimes what I want it's not necessarily the best thing for everyone. So are you, are you being selfish in that situation? What is it really that you want? Or you want the best for everyone? Or you want to make a statement? I don't know what it is, but ask that question. What is it that I really want? And number three, how can I get the desired income, outcome? Uh, the reality is, folks, is we don't accomplish much with our anger. That's not always the best way to get what we're really trying to, to get at. So the fourth way to remain untroubled is to control your anger appropriately. See, the problem isn't anger. The problem is how you release it. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 to 27, in fact, reminds us of this. The writer there says, and Paul says, be angry and do not sin. Now, let me say that again. Be angry and do not sin. And do not let the sun go down on your anger and give uh, an out, no opportunity to the devil. So it seems that inappropriate anger gives an opportunity to the devil to do his work. So did you know that you can get angry and not sin? James is saying that there's a helpful way and a harmful way to express our anger. Listen, anger is not the issue. The issue is how we express our anger. Let's be honest. Most of us express our anger in ways that actually moves, further, moves us further away from the goal. Think about it. We usually don't even get angry for the right reasons. You know, I agree. We ought to get angry at abortion. And we, got, we have to get angry at, at, at uh, injustices and, 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 and things like that. But the point is, is usually we don't get angry about those things. We get angry because somebody stole our parking spot. <laughs> And then Proverbs comes back with uh, 15, verse 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Why does a soft answer turn away wrath? First, giving a gentle answer is going to quiet not only somebody else's soul, but it's actually going to quiet our own soul. Have you noticed that the louder you speak, the more angry you seem to become? If you intentionally talk softer, what happens? You kind of begin to calm down. Your anger begins to go down. But the best way to control your anger is actually this. It's to just confess it to God. Just admit to him that you're angry. And just as important to admit it is to admit the cause. Say, you know, I'm really, I'm really hurt here. I'm, I'm really frustrated. I'm, I'm, I'm really afraid of what I'm facing right now. Those are the causes for my anger. And when you're angry at someone, you, you express anger and, and they get very defensive. But here's the point. But if you let them know why you're angry, why you're ticked off, and why you're, 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 you're feeling the way that you are, usually their defenses begin to come down because they begin to understand where you're at. You see, one thing that I've learned it's much easier to deal with people's fear or frustration or hurt than it is to deal with anger. The fifth way to remain untroubled uh, in, the, in the midst of crisis or, or, or even uh, uh, turmoil is reconfigure your mind. You need to learn to think in new ways. The way that you handle anger, the way that you sh uh, 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 deal with your anger, the way that you express your anger, you learn that. I don't know who it was, but along the way, somebody modeled it for you. And you learned from somebody modeling it to you how to deal with anger. Here's the good news. Anything that's learned can be unlearned. And that's what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He said this, Do not be conformed to this world, 
but be transformed. How do we do that, Paul? By the renewal of your mind. So how do we do it? By, the change, by changing the way that you think. You have to reconfigure, that is, pattern your, your way of thinking. Pattern uh, your mind for permanent anger management. You see, <laughs> you act angry because you feel angry. And you feel angry because you're thinking angry thoughts. Your thoughts do determine your emotions. And then watch this. Your emotions determine your actions. So if you want to break the habit of anger, then you're going to have to do some mental reconfiguring in the way that you think. In fact, I would encourage you to do what I've done in the past. I, I still am in the habit of doing this. I read a, uh, a, a book of Proverbs every day. But I would encourage you to memorize all the verses in the book of Proverbs if you deal with anger. And the next time you start to get angry, guess what is going to pop into your mind? Boy, I know that from experience. And by the way, I got I to gotta also share this with you. Anger is actually contagious. Have you seen mobs? One person get angry and then the rest of them get angry. So you need to be aware of the people that you spend time with, especially during this time, folks. Just be careful. Be, be wise in who you hang out with. Be, be careful what you allow people to speak into your life. In fact, Proverbs 22, verse 24, again in the Living Bible, says this. Keep away from angry, short-tempered people, or you will learn to be like them. Boy, that's a slap in the face for many of us, isn't it? In other words, anger is contagious. Did you know that kids learn from models that they observe? And any time that you as a parent, as an adult, lose your temper, you're modeling it for those kids. You're teaching them actually how to, be, how to, how to get and how to deal with anger. The embarrassing secret is that in millions of homes is that out of control, anger is destroying families. Last year, four million wives were beaten by angry husbands. That, that is just unacceptable. Last year, 10 million children were beaten severely by parents who simply didn't know how to control their anger. You know, as I read these statistics, my heart sank. We've got a problem with anger in America today. And you know, I looked at this and I thought for myself, you know, these are not bad people. They just haven't learned how to control their anger. And by the way, which is one of the reasons that we're dealing with this today. I'm not going to be naive enough to think that our church is excluded from these statistics. I'm sure there's people within our church, people who are listening to this message right now, who probably deal with this themselves. Now listen to what Proverbs 11:29 out of the New Living Translation says. If you exploit or abuse your family, if you ex uh, exploit or abuse your family, you'll end up with a fist full of air. And I got to tell you, I've, I've been on, at people's bedside when they're dying. And it's a sad thing to see them there alone. And the reason they have, are there alone is because they have been angry people all the way, bitter people their entire lives. And now nobody wants to be around them. Colossians chapter 3 verse 19 says this. Guys, I want you to listen up. Ladies, make sure they're listening up. You husbands must, must. You husbands must love your wives. Never treat them harshly. If this is going on in your family, if this is going on in your marital relationship, it has to stop now. And you say, how, Pastor, how can I stop it? Well, I'm glad you asked that because we've got one more point to cover, and that's the sixth way to remain untroubled. It's call on God to fill you with his love. It's where you come and you just plead with God, honestly. Just as candidly as you can, God help me love that person. And, and the reality is it could be your husband or your wife. It could be your kids. You know, and sometimes people are just hard to love. And we need God's help to love them the way that he wants us to. So I want you to listen to 1 Corinthians 13.5. It's not in your outline. 1 Corinthians 13.5. It's in the NIV version. And it says, love is not easily angered. And by the way, this is a real secret of God's power to change you from an angry person into a peaceful, calm, composed person. You see, the reality is, is, if I'm filled with God's love, almost nothing can upset me. If I'm filled with God's love, then and all of a sudden I've got that taking precedence over my anger. But if I'm not filled with, with his love, then I'm going to be angry and almost anything will upset me. 
In fact, listen to Romans chapter 15, verse 5, and I'm going to read to you out of the Living Bible. It says, May God, who gives patience, steadiness, and encouragement, help you to live in complete harmony with each other, each with the attitude of Christ towards this other, the other. And, and I like that center part of that verse. Help you to live in complete harmony with each other. You see, regardless of the differences that we have, and there's a lot of differences right now, Oh my goodness. I think that's one of the reasons a lot of people are angry right now is because we, we disagree with them. But regardless of the differences that we have, God wants us to live in harmony. What am I saying? Your relationship to Christ, listen, your relationship to Christ will determine how patient you are. Your relationship with Christ will determine how well you master anger in your life. Listen, I want to give you some hope. You can change. With God's help, you can change. And I'm here to tell you the good news, that even in a crisis where people are out of work and kids are at home and people are having to be in isolation and people are upset because they have to wear masks, where people are upset because they can't go to their favorite bar, <laughs> you can change with God's help inside of you. You know what? One of the joys in my life is my, is my great-granddaughters, and, and I love watching them. I love watching them play. I love, I love watching them run through the sprinkler. I love watching them play in the mud puddles. And so when they're in the midst of their playing, of course, especially when they're at our home, they, they, they say, oh, we're thirsty. Can I have something to drink? And, and Gayla, an amazing grandmother, went out and bought them some Capri Sun. Roaring water drink pouches for them. And Athena, who is two years old, hasn't quite figured them out. We instruct her that if she sucks from the straw, that what's in that little pouch will come out. Instead, what she does is she squeezes the pouch and gets a face full of Capri Sun. Similarly, folks, whatever is inside of you is going to come out when you're squeezed when you're under pressure. And that's why there's a pandemic of irritability while there's the pandemic of COVID-19 going on. So my challenge to you, particularly those of you who are married and you're at home, is that your husbands and your wives make a commitment to work on managing your, your anger together during this crisis. Don't let it get the best of you. However, the same goes for you when you go out to buy groceries or you go to the drugstore. Don't let the anger get the best of you. So how does God help me manage my anger? I'm glad you asked. We talked about that. What's inside comes out under, if it's squeezed or under pressure. Galatians 5.22 says this. The fruit of the Spirit is patience. You see, another thing that I've learned about the Lord is God deals with the root cause in your life, and he wants to put fruit in your life. The fruit of patience, the fruit of unforgive, uh, uh, forgiveness, the fruit that he wants to bring through you. And he's got to deal with the root problem. So what's the root problem? <laughs> it's actually the same that it's always been. We find that in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders. And it's funny. Uh, I, I kind of chuckle at this because Jesus saved his harshest words to those who are religious people, religious leaders, in fact. And he says, you brood of serpents. How can you speak good when you are evil? Now watch this. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When it comes to anger, the heart of the problem is a problem with the heart. The problem is in my tongue. Did you catch what the verse said? The problem is my heart. My mouth betrays what I'm really like inside and, and by the way, <laughs> I've been around the block. And I know that we've all used the excuse, I don't know why I said that. That's just not like me. And oftentimes I want to say, yes, it is just like us. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. We have a tendency. We all have a tendency to say what's in our hearts. So someone with a negative tongue is actually revealing a fearful heart. Someone with a boasting tongue is revealing an insecure heart. 
Somebody with an overactive tongue is actually revealing an unsettled heart. And someone with a guilty tongue, a judgmental tongue, is actually revealing the guilt that they're feeling. And a person with a, with a critical tongue is actually revealing a bitter heart. And somebody with, a fear, with fear or filthy tongue is actually revealing an impure heart. On the other hand, I want you to see this. Somebody with an encouraging tongue is revealing a happy heart. And somebody with a gentle tongue is revealing a loving heart. And somebody with a controlled tongue is actually revealing a peaceful heart. And so here's the point. What you and I need is a heart transplant. We need a new heart. And I've got good news for you. God is the one who specializes in heart transplants. In fact, David reminds us as he says this, create in me a clean heart. And he's praying to God because he says, oh God. And I think that's a good prayer that you and I need to pray because Jesus can heal your hurting heart with his love. I want you to know that Jesus cares about your pain. Jesus came to replace your frustrated heart with his peace. And Jesus came to replace your insecure heart with his power. Now, what are you going to do about this? Every week here at Sierra Vista Community Church, at the end of the service, much like we are now, at the end of the service, I point people to Jesus. And it's where I ask you to recommit your life to Jesus Christ. So can I do that? Can I just invite you to do that right now? Now, if, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ for the very first time, I want to invite you to take that very first step. Let me pray with you. And after I'm done praying, we're all going to pray together. But let's bow our heads in prayer as we go before the Lord. Why don't you tell the Lord Jesus, sadly? I've got to admit that often we get angry at the people we love the most. The ones that we're closest to. Because we forget that you are the source of all that we need, not others. So Jesus, would you help me to remember that when I expect anyone other than you to meet my needs that I'm going to be let down. And as I get let down, I get angry. And Father, I'm sure that there are many people that are listening to this message right now who are struggling with irritability and short temper and anger due to the hurt or the frustration of the insecurity or fear that they're feeling during this crisis. So Father, I pray for them. I pray that today they will experience hope and healing in a brand new way. And if you're at home alone, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to do the same thing that, you, that I asked you to do last week. Would you just pray aloud to the Lord? Why don't you pray something like this to him? Dear God, as I count the cost of my unmanaged anger, I admit that I have a problem with my anger and I need your help. With your help, I'm resolving to change from the inside out to choose to manage my anger. And Jesus, I'm keenly aware of the way my anger has hurt other people. And please forgive me for try, trying to control things and then getting angry when I can't. Jesus, would you help me to consider before reacting? Help me to control my anger appropriately and help me to learn to configure my mind with your word. And Jesus Christ, today, I open my life completely, completely 100% to your love. Fill me with your love. Let it push out all the irritability and all the anger. Save me. Father, rescue me from myself and change me. Make the changes in me that only you can make. I want to trust you with my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now again, I just want to remind you that if you made a decision today, if you have a prayer need or perhaps you have just a practical need that you'd like to bring before us and, and and, and, uh, and share with us. We, we want to serve our community. So if, if you would do that, send us an email, get a hold of our office. You'll see the information on the screen here. We'll be glad to respond to that. We're here for you. We want to love our community. So I want to bless, bless you as, uh, as we end our time together. Uh, just ask the Lord to be with you this week. So may the grace of our Father and may the love of His Son and may the power of the Holy Spirit be in you and give you everything that you need, including the strength to handle, listen, everything that comes against you this week. And may he keep you safe and healthy. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And we look forward to connecting with you again next week. God bless you.
just tell me to do what you want me to lord speak to my heart right now speak to my heart right now lord speak to my heart right now lord tell me to do what you want me to lord speak to my heart right now you are. 